Hey, thanks for joining us today for Center Point Church Online, and what a great time of worship. I'm so grateful we get to be in God's presence together, wherever we are. We are the body of Christ, and if you've just joined us and this is new for you, I'm so glad that you're a part of the experience with us, and we're about life-changing connections, and I hope that you'll begin to make yours with us today. And uh, if you've got a prayer request, put it in the, prayer, in the chat. Let us know how we can be praying. And uh, if, if you haven't done so yet, I want to urge you to pray as we give our tithes and offerings. And even though we are maybe in our living room or our family room, we're the body of Christ together. And uh, we give our tithes and our offerings to give our affection to our God and see his mission thrive through our church. And so I would invite you to give uh, today. You can do that by going to mycenterpoint.tv and click on give. Uh, and let's just take a moment now for those of us who are giving to pray over what we're giving and to consecrate those offerings to God and get our hearts ready for a message from his word. Does that sound good? Let's pray together for just a moment, okay? Pray with me. God, thank you for all the goodness you pour into our lives. Thank you, Lord, for our work, for our family, for our provision. And Lord, as we give our tithes and offerings, as we click on, on a button and, or we did it earlier in the week, Lord, we consecrate those offerings to you now. We want your mission in this world to thrive. We want lots of people to know the goodness of Jesus and the power of the gospel. And so we pray, Father, as we give our tithes and offerings, that would be the effect. And so we pray in Jesus' name that we could hear your word today. Amen. Say amen or type amen. Let somebody know that you are part of this experience right now. Come on and type amen so that somebody sees that you're, you're here. So I grew up on the East Coast, New Jersey, but I was actually born in Virginia, in Alexandria. And uh, growing up in Alexandria, lots of stuff is old, you know, and uh, there's this one place in Alexandria, Virginia. It's this little tiny house. It's called a spite house. And it looks uh, kind of like this. And this, this little house has a backstory. And the backstory is that somewhere around 1830, this guy, John Hollinsbury, uh, had, had a problem, and that was that people were making noise in the alley beside his house, and it kept him up at night and frustrated and made him mad. And so he decided to spite those people by building a house right there in the alley. <laughs> and by legal requirement, he also had to live in it. And so it was a tiny house, seven and a half feet wide by about you know, 20 feet long or so, and uh, he did it to spite those people, but then he had to live in it, the spite house. And people live in it to this day. The spite house. It's kind of a phenomenon in architecture, actually, this thing called a spite house. And uh, one of the earlier ones was in New York. And in New York, there's this guy who had a sort of useless piece of property that was just over five feet wide and 100 feet long. But he decided to offer it uh, for sale to the guy who owned the property next to him. And he said, hey, I'd like to you know, offer you to buy my property. You could expand your building or put in a garden out front or whatever you'd want to do. Uh, I'd like to offer it for $5,000. And the guy responded to him and said, I wouldn't buy that measly trash piece of property for $5,000, you punk, or whatever the 1830s version of that would be. And instead, he offered him 1000 bucks and said he wouldn't give a penny more. Anyway, the, the, the owner of the property was so enraged, so miffed, so mad about that, that this insulting offer, that he just decided just to spite the guy that he would build a, a spite house. It wasn't called that at that time, but it, it, that one was five and a half feet wide by a hundred feet long and four stories high. And he lived in that till his dying day. Uh, and eventually it was torn down, but it was another spite house. Here's the thing. You know, you can, you can build a spite house, but the problem is that then you have to live in it. But I'm not talking anymore about physical architectural projects. I'm talking about how we deal with people and ourselves and relationships. And God doesn't want any of us to live in a spite house. God wants us to live in the healing power of the love and forgiveness of Christ. That's what God wants for us. And so the, the short version of the main idea of my message is just simply this. I give out what I live in, love and forgiveness. That's the main idea. I want you to say it out loud. I know you might be just with your family at home or in the car or whatever, but I want you to say that main idea out loud with me. Say it. Ready? Go. I give out 
what I live in, love and forgiveness. Say it one more time. I give out what I live in, love and forgiveness. Now, I'm going to expound on that, and to do so, I'm going to take you uh, into Colossians, Colossians chapter uh, 3. And so I want you to turn there now. This is the sixth part of our series called Supreme Overall, and we're going through the book of Colossians and taking in the deep and rich truth of it all, and, and we've pivoted it. It began with so much that was just about Christ himself, and then, and then the next part of Colossians calls us to how we're living and what we're doing. And if you took in the message last week, which I hope you did, and the fifth part of this series, it, it was uh, Pastor, Pastor Ann Hansen, my wife, and she shared this amazing message about uh, getting rid of the relationship killers and to do that by setting our sights on heaven. And it was a brilliant message, and it's a brilliant call from Holy Spirit in the scriptures to do that. But if last week's message was about getting rid of the relationship killers, this week is a message that focuses on building up the relationship refreshers. And so that's kind of what we're going to see here in Colossians chapter 2. I hope you got your Bible out by now. I hope you've had a minute to flip through the pages. If you didn't yet, do it now. Uh, I really do want you to make sure. Don't be passive. I know it's tempting to just do the dishes and listen to me in the background, but come on back to me. Get the Word of God open to Colossians chapter 3, and this is what, uh, what we find here in Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts, for as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. And let the message of Christ in all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom that he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wow. Just say it with me. Wow. <laughs> this is one of those passages of scripture that it's just like one hit after another, you know? But could you just imagine for a minute? Imagine if we could live out everything that we just quickly read through. And could you imagine how that would affect our families and our relationships? Can you imagine if we lived out everything we just read through, how cared for and nurtured our kids would feel? how cherished and valued our, our spouses would feel, how awesome about friendship our friends and coworkers would feel in connecting with us. I mean, can you imagine? I just think this scripture contains so much wisdom about how to live to bring blessing uh, in, the, in the world around us and especially in the relationships around us. So right now, why don't you just say out loud, God help me live that stuff. <laughs> just say it with me. God help me live that stuff. I got to admit, you know, I, I read those words and, and I find myself saying, I, that's where I'd like to be. And you know what I'm saying as I'm acknowledging, I don't know if I'm quite there yet. And hopefully most of us would have the uh, humility to acknowledge that. But, you know, I got to say, Sometimes I hear people say something along the lines of, you know, God doesn't care about behavior modification. The gospel isn't about behavior modification. And I find myself thinking, have you read the actual Bible? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, have you read so much of the Bible, like the parts that we just read? So here's the thing. I mean, the truth is that the actual gospel in terms of salvation isn't in, in and of itself dependent upon anyone's behavior modification. I mean, it's, it's perfectly uh, acceptable. Well, I wouldn't say perfectly acceptable, but it is possible to uh, receive the gospel of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of sins and and head your way to heaven and to continue to be a complete royal jerk 
the whole time until you get there. That is, you know, theoretically it's possible. But I don't think that's God's best. I think that God actually does care about behavior modification because God cares about you and I growing and because God cares about the relationships in our lives. And when I read these pages of scripture, what I, what I find myself thinking is that it's as though the Holy Spirit is whispering and saying, actually, I, I'm really into behavior modification. I, have you read my book? I really do care about changing up the way you live because I really do care about your relationships and, and the way you behave has such an impact on the world around you and on your relationships that it matters so much to me that I work on those things with you. I, I feel like it's the Holy Spirit saying, I do care about the mods. Let's start doing some more. I love to see what you look like when there's more of my goodness shining through your life. So let's be courageous to follow and to partner with Holy Spirit Christ in you, the hope of glory. And it's as though the Holy Spirit is saying, I, I want that internal supernatural reality to begin to be more and more reflected and matching up with the external behavior, natural reality of who you are. And so that's kind of what I see big picture in the pages uh, of scripture and, and in particular in, in Colossians, that out of God's grace, he would beckon you and I to grow, and that it would include some change-ups along the way. But in particular, I just want to dive back into the, what we just read so quickly in verse 12. Okay, so go back to verse 12 with me for just a moment, and I want you to just read these words out loud, right where you are. Kind of sit up in, in your couch or in your chair or in wherever you are, and I want you to read this out loud with me. Ready? Go. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves... You must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Wow. Five particular elements are mentioned here. You know, the, the truth is that whole passage that we read, it actually contains 17 change-ups that Holy Spirit is beckoning me and you into. And in this first verse, there's five of them right out of the gate, just given to us. And and these are, I think you probably would agree with me, amazing things to, to see and experience in a person. I mean, uh, tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Can you imagine if, if you were to be fully dressed with that kind of clothing, what your family would be like, what your experience would be like with your kids and their experience of you and, and all of the above? I just want you to ask yourself a question, and it's really a discipleship question. What would change in your relationships if you would wear those clothes more often? That's a discipleship question I want you to be thinking about, and when you meet with your small group, I want you to talk about together or with your family. What would change in your relationships if you would wear those clothes more often? Because sometimes you got to just change your clothes. You ever have that experience where, you know, you, you put some clothes on and then you go look at yourself in the mirror and you go, nope. And you head back to the drawer or the closet and get something else out. You didn't realize how wrinkled that thing was. You didn't even know it had that big old stain on it, right? And it's okay to do that. And it's important to do that spiritually with our lives, especially in terms of how we affect other people. I mentioned that there are in the passage that we just read, the whole, verse 12 to verse 17, there's uh, 17 modifications, like change-ups, that are all mentioned. And, and I can't give you a message on 17 things, but I definitely want to make sure that I at least give due attention to how this verse began. It's worth drilling down on for just a bit together for a moment. And so I want you to uh, read this together with me again, but this time we're going to read it out loud from the NIV. And and I want you to say it nice and strong. Uh, verse 12 from the NIV. Read it with me out loud. Ready? Go. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. I just love the fact that God and his majesty and his wisdom, Holy Spirit bringing this inspiration through uh, through Paul and Timothy and this word, 
starts with, with, with basically, hey, I know I'm going to tell you, you know, 17 things to work on in your life, but, but first, can I just tell you who you are? Can I just tell you who you are? You are chosen by God. You are holy. You're dearly loved. I just am so grateful for that. And I want you to be taking that in deeply right now. Can you hear it? It's not just an old dusty message for some group of people in Colossae back in the day. It, it's for you. It's God. It's Holy Spirit saying to you, yes, there's things to work on, but first let me tell you who you are. You are chosen by God. You are holy. You are dearly loved. And, and, and this applies to each and every one of us simply by virtue of the fact that we've turned to Jesus and said, I believe in you. And we receive his grace and his mercy and his love. And that's where we live. We live in this reality that we are chosen by God. We live in this reality that we are holy, made holy by what Jesus has done. We live in this reality that we are dearly loved. I want you to just say this out loud. Just say it. I'm chosen by God. I'm holy. Say it. I'm dearly loved. Now let's say it all together. Just say it with me. I'm chosen by God. I'm holy. I'm dearly loved. Say that last part one more time. I'm dearly loved. Just say it again. I'm dearly loved. This is where I live. I, I think it's important that we recognize Holy Spirit began here. Let me tell you who you are. This is where you really live. This is home. This is where you live. I'm gonna give out what I live in. And so I wanna, I wanna make sure I'm living in the love and forgiveness of, of Christ. And that's what we're invited to recognize as we start this passage of scripture. So let me ask another discipleship question. And really, I'm asking you to think about this and talk about it in your group, but what helps you to embrace how loved by God you are? What helps you to embrace how loved by God you are? I think it's an important question to ask because whatever our answer is to that, we need to do more of it. What helps me to embrace how loved by God I am? Sometimes for me, it's just stopping at a verse like the one I just read and saying it out loud a few times until I feel it deep down. I'm chosen by God. I'm holy. I'm dearly loved. That's where we've got to start. So <laughs> a few days ago, I was, uh, I was up really late working on stuff. And, and in the morning, I was getting ready. I had a bunch of things to get to quickly. And, and anyway, uh, Anne came into the bathroom. My wife came into the bathroom, and I'm standing there kind of getting ready and and, and she said, here's your belt, you left it downstairs. And she said it pretty much just like that. Here's your belt, you left it downstairs. Well, listen, something inside of me, I started, I started a whole story. Like what, what I heard was, you lazy slob leaving all your junk all over the place. How inadequate you are. What a, what a disappointment you are. Like that's what I heard in my mind. That is not what she said. That's what I heard. It was mostly because I had had like four hours of sleep and I was super tired. But, uh, I, and I started another uh, answer back in my mind. In my mind, I was thinking, you have no idea. I was up late working on this book and working on this message and I've been working hard and I was just in, a little uncomfortable with my belt and I was gonna, you know, I, and that whole thing was going in my mind and, and the blood was boiling. This all takes place within like three seconds, right? But it's all there, you know? And, and uh, I, 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 I didn't let all of that stuff out, but what I did let out was, I was gonna get it in a second, right? Yeesh. <laughs> yeah, I said that. I mean, it wasn't a lot of words, but I said a lot, didn't I? And you know what Anne's answer to me was? I'll tell you what her answer to me was. Her answer was, that's all. And she said it all with her eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> but fortunately, after 17 years of marriage, I'm now fluent in eyebrow. <laughs> I can't even give you the translation or the interpretation of what was said in that moment. It's not appropriate for church, not even at home online church. No, I can't even tell you what she said, but she said it. 
And I knew, <laughs> but I didn't have time and I was too stewing with my upset. And so huffed and puffed, stormed out of the bedroom, went off to my important things to do, whatever it was. And, but man, I felt that burn inside. And I know some of you know what I'm talking about. You know that burn when you just had a thing and an altercation and the blood just boiling, the burn inside. And I had a moment later, I'm like, nah, this, I'm feeling this burn. What's it about? And then I heard the still small voice of the Lord. And he said, it's about the fact that you were a jerk to your wife. Okay, that wasn't the still small voice of the Lord. He's probably nicer than that. But it was at least something inside of me that recognized, yeah, I was a jerk. That's really what that moment boiled down to. Yeah, so, you know, we, we read the Bible. You know? We read Colossians 3, 12 through 17. And we find, you know, 17 glorious, amazing ways to just be awesome, right? And we read all of those things. And, and then we have moments like the one I just described. And pretty much if there were 17 ways to just be awesome, Christ in you and all of that, I missed all 17 of them in like a 20-second moment. What do we do with that? <laughs> what do we do with that? You know, it's important that we recognize this truth. I give out what I live in. And I want you to just think about that. I give out what I live in. I give out what I live in. Love and forgiveness. Just say it with me one more time. I give out what I live in. And I, I, I want us to recognize together how crucial it is to, to take that to heart. Because, you know, we read in verse 14, right? I skipped over it pretty quickly, but let's look at it. And you can say it out loud with me. Say it with me. Go. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. The moment I just described to you, if that's what I'm called to do, then I was just naked, right? I, I was not, you know, fully dressed, and, and I have to recognize that I need to go home. Do you know what I'm saying? I need to go home. If I could go home to love, to that place where I know that no matter what, I'm safe in my Father's love, that no matter how I've dropped the ball, no matter how I've missed the mark, and no matter the fact that I've missed all 17 of those things and blown it, it does not change the fact that I am still and always will be by virtue of who Jesus is. I will always be chosen by God, holy, dearly loved, and you will be too, chosen by God, holy, dearly loved. And if I can go home to that reality and just live there in that love of God, then I might be able to give out what I live in. Because the alternative is, after I've made a mess of things, is to just stew in the shame of it. What a shame I am <laughs> becomes the trajectory. And that's a lie from the pit of hell, by the way. That, that is not true about any son or daughter of the Most High God. She is not a shame. She is not a disappointment. He may have made a mistake and a mess up, but he is not a mistake and a mess up. If I live in the shame, I'm gonna give out shamefulness. If I live in my anger, I'm gonna give out just a bunch of rage. Do you see how it works? And so it becomes important for you and I to be people who, who can go back to living in, in the love house and not the anger house or the spite house or the shame house or the fear house or whatever else. I give out what I live in. Love and forgiveness. So we go back there. And it's important that we would because there's going to be lots of opportunities for us to need to give out that love. <laughs> so uh, I got to take you to verse 13 because we've been together for quite a long time already and I'm only halfway through. I'm sorry. <laughs> and so verse 13, it says, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. I, I, I'm grateful for that verse. Aren't you? I'm grateful for that verse. In particular, I'm grateful for that verse where it says, make allowance for each other's faults, because I feel like Holy Spirit had me in mind 
<laughs> and that was inspired. Like, this one is for John Hansen's kids and wife, you know, specifically for them, because I have a lot of faults. And I am grateful that God's word speaks to other people, in a sense, about me, saying, yeah, you're going to need to make some allowance for faults. And I think we need to recognize this, that there is something reasonable and rational, rational about making allowance for one another's faults. Like, we start there. Because if we had to react to every little thing someone did that was a disappointment, there would not be any peace whatsoever. There has to be a way in which we can make an allowance for faults. You know, certain things that we just need to let go. I mean, Proverbs 19.11 says it is to a person's glory to overlook an offense. And so if we can, we should. If we can. And we can't always. Because sometimes things are more than just a fault. They are a true harm or damage or grievance. And there's a difference there, isn't there? We need to be able to recognize it. Yes, I'm going to make allowance for faults. And that, that means... I'm not even keeping, I'm not even going to deal with it. It doesn't need to be. I just say, ah, whatever. She's just having a tough day or he's just uh, been, you know, under some stress and we let it go. But there's other moments where we have to recognize harm's been done and I can't just forget about it. I can't, I need to deal with it. And then we must. And the dealing with it that God's calling us to is the dealing with it called forgiveness. It's the F word. And the title of my message is don't forget the F word. And now maybe you get why my main idea is I give out what I live in, forgiveness and love, love and forgiveness. And so we, we need to talk about this, uh, this issue of forgiveness. And the, the truth is forgiving is hard. It just is. Sometimes forgiving is hard. You can say that out loud. Say it. Forgiving is hard. Just go ahead. <laughs> just acknowledge it with me. Forgiving is hard. We're allowed to say that. We're allowed to feel that. We're still called to do it. But let's just start with where a lot of us are, which is it's hard. Well, why is it hard? Well, because I've been hurt. I mean, that's the, 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 the reality, right? If, if I've got to forgive, that means something wrong has been done. So forgiving is hard because I've been truly hurt. And it feels like when someone comes along and says, you got to forgive, that we're kind of like someone who just got their leg broken and someone's saying, come on, get up and let's go. And we're going, wait, my leg's broken. I can't walk. It's okay. It's okay to ex acknowledge that, that forgiveness is hard because, you know, maybe I truly am hurting. And forgiving is hard because I might have to admit my part in the problem. It, it, usually things aren't only one way. Usually there's, there's two, a two-way street, and we all know that. And forgiving means I might need to acknowledge my part in the problem. And then a, th a third reason why forgiving is hard is, gosh, it's just easier to justify myself. All right, it's a lot easier to just justify myself than to have to forgive. I mean, because I have a right to be mad because they truly did wrong. There was bad things that they did, and I just want to justify myself. It's easier. It's not really God's best, <laughs> even though it is a little easier. And then, you know, I want my sense of justice to be satisfied. That's another thing that makes forgiving hard because I, I'm stumbling over what I think justice should look like and I want my sense of justice to be satisfied. That it may be or may not be God's view of what justice looks like, but I'm, I'm caught up in that and so I can't really move to the forgiving. And maybe forgiving is hard because I just misunderstand what forgiving is. So let's just talk about it together for a moment. And let's start with what it isn't. So Hear this with me. Forgiving is not forgetting. It just isn't. We are human beings with a real memory bank. And just because we forgive doesn't mean that the memory bank in us is going to be erased. And we shouldn't expect that. We can expect by God's grace that as we forgive, the, the sense of trauma of the harm can decrease over time. That's something that God is faithful to do for us. But forgiving isn't forgetting. So I absolve you of thinking that's what it needs to be. It's okay if the memory comes up again and we keep working through it, if it does, with more forgiveness. And forgiving is not avoidance. Forgiving is not just sweeping it under the rug and going, oh, it doesn't matter. No, no, that's not what forgiving is. You'll, you'll see that in just a moment. Forgiving is also not necessarily just going back to normal. It doesn't necessarily mean that. Uh, there may be a, 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 a strict new kind of boundary that never even existed before. And that's okay. That can be part of what forgiving includes. 
And uh, forgiving is not no consequences. Uh, most of us who are parents can probably relate to this, that our heart towards our kids would very easily be, yes, I do forgive you. And also there's going to be the consequence of whatever it might be. And so just have those things in mind. It might make it a little easier to step towards living out this forgiveness. I, I give out what I live in, love and forgiveness. And so the forgiveness is what we're moving towards because that's what God calls us to. And, and I recognize there were 17 things in this passage of scripture, but I've chosen to focus in on this one because I think it may be the hardest one. And I think it may be one of the most important ones. I mean, this one is the one that made it into the Lord's prayer. And so let's keep stepping towards it. Take a deep breath, really. Like right where you are, take a deep breath, <laughs> sit up in your, in your seat, and, and dive in a little deeper into forgiveness. This F word should be used. Uh, forgiveness is a word, a fiemi in the Greek text of the Bible, and it really has meaning that matters. It's to release, to let go, to keep no longer, to refuse to seek revenge, to refuse to continue to be consumed by a past injustice. Now take another deep breath. Because some of us, I mean, we're thinking, oh, things are starting to bubble up and come to mind. It's okay. It's the Holy Spirit wanting to bring more healing for each one of us. Forgiveness, in a sense, says, I refuse to pay you back for your wrong, even though I feel like I have a right to. Or I refuse to take revenge on you, even though I, I, I might want to. That's an important dynamic of what forgiveness is about. I refuse to hurt you, even though you hurt me. These are more reasons why forgiveness can be really hard, but it's important. It's what we're called to. It's what we're called to step into. Let me ask you another discipleship question, and I want you to think about this. Share it with your group later or with somebody that you're walking, a spiritual walk in Christ with. This is the question. Can you think of an example of a person uh, who has forgiven you? And how did it affect you? I, I was thinking about this, and honestly, I found it hard to think about examples of people who had forgiven me. You know what came to my mind more readily? Is the people I'd forgiven. You know why? Because we tend to remember more like how we've been hurt than, uh, than maybe how we've been blessed. But I want you to think about that. It, it, can you think of an example of a person who's forgiven you, and how did that affect you? It's an important part of our discipleship is just to consider that because that's what we want to give out, what we live in. And so let me share with you a process for forgiving that would be healthy and, and life-giving and healing. First of all, acknowledge the pain and give it to God. Remember, we're not doing avoidance and sweeping it under the rug and just forgetting. No, acknowledge the pain. Have a moment with God where you just spell it all out. It was this and that and this and it hurt. God, it hurt. And here's what I do. It literally, they're like this. I have a moment with God and I name all of the pain, acknowledge it, lament it, feel the feels of it, say it out loud, write it in the journal. But then I say, God, I surrender to you the pain, disappointment, frustration, and anger that I'm feeling towards this person about this thing. I surrender that all to you, all the pain of it. I want you to do that with whatever's coming to your mind right now. Acknowledge the pain. Give it to God. And the second part is express forgiveness in God's presence. So once you've acknowledged that pain and, and surrendered it to God, the next part is to express forgiveness in God's presence. This is just you having a moment with God. And with God, it could be with another friend you're praying with, but you, you say, and so God, in your presence, I forgive this person for that stuff that I just surrendered to you. And you say it out loud, maybe even several times, and you'll feel it as it's coming out. What's coming out is the poison that you've been holding on to, that you're being damaged by. But as you begin to express, I forgive them, I forgive them, God, in your presence, it begins to come out. And then third thing is bless the person in God's presence. Yes, yes, that person who did you wrong, who damaged you, who harmed you, bless them in God's presence. This is just you having a moment with God. 
And you say, God, and now I bless so-and-so with uh, joy in their life for this and peace in their circumstance for that and growth. And <laughs> I really bless them with growth, God. <laughs> you take that moment and you say, God, I bless them. I bless them. There's power that begins to generate and then flow, healing, loving power that then begins to flow from you into the spiritual atmosphere. And most importantly, you begin to experience healing as you give the healing of blessing. And you're still just in God's presence. So the fourth part is uh, you express forgiveness to the person directly, if reasonable. If reasonable really matters. And I would even say, this part you may work on with a counselor, with a mentor, with a, a therapist, with a, a, a friend or coach, right? Because there's different levels of harm that are done. And some things it is reasonable for us to reach out and have a meeting or a phone call or whatever and, and express that forgiveness. And other times it's just not even reasonable to for, for reasons where there was abuse or there's physical harm or emotional endangerment or whatever. We, we say if reasonable. You reach out and express the forgiveness to the person. And that looks like looking them in the eye and saying, you hurt me when, and fill in the blanks. And nevertheless, I've surrendered that to God and I forgive you for it. And then if you can, take that next step and I bless you. I mean, right to someone's face and I bless you. I bless you now with, and fill in the blanks with all kinds of good things that come from the Father's heart for that person. What you'll find is if you can do the process that I just spelled out for you, you will experience healing. You know, the truth is, you do live in love and forgiveness. As a child of God, as a, as a follower of Jesus, like, this is just the reality. You live in love and forgiveness. And so remember this message, I give out what I live in. Remember where you live. You live in a mansion filled with the goodness and glory and power and love and healing of God. And you've been crowned by his mercy. All your sins have been forgiven and washed away. You have the gift of the mercy of God crowning your life every single day. You never are lacking in the forgiveness of your sins. Your Father in heaven always looks at you through the blood of Jesus, forgiven, holy, chosen, dearly loved. It never stops being the reality of who you are. That's where you live. You live in that love house. You live in that forgiveness house. I give out what I live in, the love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And so that's what we're talking about today is a journey of moving more and more into that reality where we, where we live that way. Now, I know that I've I've taken so much time today, but I gotta go a little step further and talk about the flip side. It's one thing to forgive, but it's another thing to be the person who's done the wrong. And I think that we need to take some responsibility for that too. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 5, uh, 23, if you're putting your you know, gift at the altar, but you remember you've done wrong to somebody, go to them and acknowledge it, make it right, be reconciled. The, he doesn't use the word apologize, but that is the essence of what Jesus is getting at. And then we read in Romans 12, 18, uh, as much as it depends on you, if it's possible, be at peace with everyone. That would probably require us to sometimes apologize when we've done wrong. And so I want us to talk about, uh, about uh, apologies. And so if you're a child of the 80s, I just want you to sing this along with me if you can. It's too late to apologize. That was awkward, wasn't it? It was definitely awkward for me. I know it probably was awkward for you too. But that's a myth, isn't it? It's a myth that it's too late to apologize. In fact, unless the person is passed on, there's still a possibility for us to do just that. But we need to make sure that we're actually bringing an apology and not a faux apology. So let's talk about apologies for a minute. Let me just tell you, there's, there's, there's ways of quote and I'm using those air quotes with strength right now. It, it, there's a way to apologize that isn't really an apology at all. Those are faux apologies. Like, for example, uh, here's a faux apology. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> faux apology alert going off big time, right? And another uh, faux apology is, well, I'm sorry if I hurt you. Did you get the if out of there? You know what I'm talking about, right? I'm sorry if I hurt you. It owns nothing, doesn't it? It's a faux apology. A, a third one is, 
Well, I'm sorry you feel that way. That is not an apology. Faux apology alert is ringing loud. Uh, Another one, uh, I'm sorry, but that wasn't my intention. Listen, we're known by our actions, not our intentions. (laughs) So that's a faux apology if there ever was one. And then, I'm sorry, but... Listen, get your butt out of the way. It's blocking your apology. (laughs) If you are apologizing, if you're saying I apologize or I'm sorry, it can never be followed by the word but. That just doesn't work. So uh, this is an important thing to, to recognize, that there's an art, a spiritual art to really doing, uh, doing what Jesus said, Matthew 5, 23, and doing it right. And it's something that probably all of us need to work on a little bit. But it's, it's beautiful when it, when it happens. It, it makes it more possible that real healing can take place. And the essence of it is, if you've blown it, you've got to own it. That's just the way it goes. I think that's what we're called to. Back to, uh, hold on, before I go back to Colossians, let me show you what I mean by a good apology. A good apology looks like this. It looks like saying, I want to apologize to you. I hurt you when I did this and that and this other thing. I caused you pain by what I did, and it was wrong, and I'm sorry. That's it. When we're on the receiving side of something like that, our heart may begin to open again to reconnecting or to at least extending true peace or forgiveness, but some of us need to be willing to take that step. And in fact, in in our ongoing relationships with kids, with friends, with colleagues, with spouses, with parents, we, we must develop that capacity and make sure that we live into it because that's part of the house that we live in. It's that love and forgiveness house. Back to Colossians 3. Colossians 3, it says in verse 13, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. That's what we're called to. Is remember I told you my wife brought me my belt and said, here's your belt, you left it downstairs. And then uh, I said this, and then she spoke eyebrow to me. <laughs> and I couldn't tell you what was said in that. But uh, what happened was later that day I came home, and I said, hey, babe, can I talk to you? And I kind of grabbed her gently around the arms and said, can I talk to you? Looking her in the eye and I just had to say to her, I was a jerk this morning and I frustrated you and hurt you by snapping at you and barking at you and, and just my tone and what I said was just wrong. You deserve better and I'm sorry. You know what she said to me? This time she spoke with her lips <laughs> and she kissed me and said, I forgive you. We hugged. Peace was restored. I'm so grateful that when when people are walking with the Spirit of God, those kind of moments can happen. I recognize that there are a lot of things that some of us are dealing with that are much more severe than, hey, you left your belt downstairs, and then you got in a bad mood and snapped about it. I recognize that there's much more uh, that some of us are carrying and dealing with, and it requires more, much more of the process that I just described. But it is within reach, and it is what God is calling you and I to. And I want you to just take to heart what we just read. I'm gonna ask you to read it out loud, verse 13, one last time. Take a deep breath, Colossians 3, verse 13. Read it with me. Ready? Go. Go. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. The Lord forgave you. I want you to just personalize that and say, the Lord forgave me. Just say it with me. The Lord forgave me. The Lord forgave me. Whatever the devil's throwing at me, what I did, what went wrong, how I messed up, here's my answer. The Lord forgave me. Say it with me. The Lord forgave me. That accusation comes, that, uh, and it's true because you did blow it, right? The Lord forgave me. The Lord forgave me. Now, I, 
I, I want to embrace that. And I want you to embrace that too. And if you know the Lord Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, it's probably uh, pretty easy to come back into that place, that house of love and forgiveness uh, where you can live so that you can give out what you live in. But I know that there's probably some of us, you've jumped in and joined in on an online church service and you're just kind of trying to put the pieces together. This is the biggest piece of them all. The Lord forgave me. Like that's how I live my life with the mercy and forgiveness that comes to me through Jesus Christ. And it's available to you. I believe that it's not a mistake. It's not by accident that you are suddenly part of this online church moment. It's because God is drawing you to himself. And in this moment, there's an invitation for you to receive what so many others of us have received, the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the way we receive it is in a moment in time, we step across the line from uh, on the other side where we're just kind of a spectator checking things out to where we cross the line to finally say, I'm on this side now. Jesus Christ, I believe in you. And then we're on a journey, learning lots of things, getting lots of questions answered, but it starts somewhere. Maybe for somebody right now, it's going to start in this moment. And I want, I want to ask you to pray with me. And let's pray together and ask God to to awaken our soul. Would you pray with me? You can close your eyes if you'd like to, or you can keep looking forward at the screen however you'd like to, but would you pray with me right now? Sit up, don't fall asleep on me, but let's pray together. God, thank you for your word, and thank you that you, <laughs> you want good things for us, and you care about the mods, and you want to see the change-ups happen in our life, and, and one of the biggest change-ups would be this thing about, about forgiveness, and so I'm asking God for you, your help for all of us, that we'd be able to give out what we live in, love and forgiveness, more and more. So Lord, help us, because it's hard, but would you help us, God, to actually live into this and give it out? And I also pray right now, Father, for somebody who needs to spiritually wake up. And I'm praying for you right now, if you've never said yes to Jesus, or maybe this was, you know, happened when you were a kid, but it, you've been wandering and and it's time to come home. But either way, if you're, if you're finally in a place of saying, I need to say yes to Jesus. I want to ask him to forgive my sins. I want to know that I, I'm forgiven like that. Then right now, I want you to say yes to Jesus. And you can pray with me as a way of beginning that life in the kingdom of God. And so you would pray and maybe say something like this. Say, Jesus Christ, I believe in you. I give my life to you. I believe you paid the price for my sins. I believe you conquered death and the grave, and I believe you're alive. And so Jesus Christ, I'm asking for you to be the Lord of my life. Jesus Christ, I believe in you to be the Lord and Savior of my life from this moment on. Just say it out loud with me. Jesus Christ, I believe in you. Say it with me. Jesus Christ, I believe in you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if you have uh, just prayed with me and it's kind of the first time for you to say yes to Jesus, or you might say, I'm actually rededicating my life to Jesus. I want you to click the button if you're on our online uh, church platform or if you're in Facebook, you just type into the comments, I'm giving my life to Jesus. I mean, just be bold. It's time to cross the line. Let it be known. I'm giving my life to Jesus. We'd love to uh, pray with you and to continue to connect with you so that you'd grow on this journey moving forward. Would you pray with me for just a moment longer? It's good to just linger in God's presence uh, as we get ready to, to worship again. And let's pray for a moment longer. God, thank you that we live in the house called love, established by the grace and mercy of Jesus. And I pray, Father, right now, again, for, for, for my friends that are joining me for this online moment, uh, to embrace deeply this reality of being loved. While we're praying together, can you just say this with me again? I'm chosen by God. Say it. Say it. I'm holy. Say it. I'm holy. And I'm dearly loved. Just say all of that one time more with me. I'm chosen by God. I'm holy. I'm dearly loved. It's the truth about you. Just let it, let it soak into the deepest places. And, and now I want to ask if you're part of our prayer or ministry team, pastors or 
prophetic team or prayer team members, if you have a word that you feel is from God, that you, that you know that it needs to be shared, would you just type that into the comments so that others could, uh, could take in that sense of what God is saying, the words of edification and encouragement uh, and exhortation. Uh, and, and if you have a specific word for something that you're praying for, a healing or a touch from God, uh, let that be known in the comments as well. And if you need someone to pray for you, type it into the comments. We've got people that are ready to share God's love with you in this moment. But now, would you join me? Sit up a bit in your seat, and we're going to worship together and give God our affection, our adoration in this time of worship. Let's give him our hearts again together.